And so it's exciting to to talk about this topic. Um, I think conductivity gets a uh, it's a great sensor in the sense that um, it it will detect ions in solution. Um, it's not as selective as what uh, like a pH sensor, which is going to look for a specific ion, hydrogen ion in solution. Um, but it's a great because it's the the topics that lead up to there, and so some of the concepts we'll talk about here can be used in terms of chemistry and and of, as far as reading graphs, this is an important portion too to help students to uh, understand that it's reflective of concentration, chemical concentration. And so um, we're going to do some some demos that will maybe help students to land and get a better feel for it. It's the less common of, of I would call an instrumentation in uh, as given in examples, um, conductivity data as we see it. So like I say, I'm going to try to start with some great co solid uh, concrete examples, and then we'll move on to um, more applications. Okay, with that, let's continue on. And uh, the solutions for your solutions um, is our is our talk today and um, use of conductivity sensor in chemistry. Uh, like I said, my name is uh, Roger Palmer, a product manager here at uh, Pasco, and Barbara is a curriculum specialist. I had taught for 30 years, uh, 28 years, sorry, um, and uh, in chemistry in high school and AP. Uh, some physics and some environmental. And so all of those had helped to, to really show where conductivity can become important. I'll show some examples as well where it's important, you know, around the school uh, in a slide or two as, as well that we can take a look at that extends beyond this so that your colleagues may be able to use the conductivity sensor as well. So with that, before we start, I just want to mention a few things where you, you may ask, where can I get this recording when we're done? Uh, when we're finished, you will get an email that um, will have a little quiz that you'll fill out, or a little survey um, that you fill out, sorry, and that as you finish that, then you'll be emailed the um, link for the the uh, webinar. You'll get the certificate in that same manner. So um, just so you know, at the end, I'll, I'll re-remind you that that's coming. Um, but that's that's coming up. That will be good to know. Some of the things that you can use Zoom to help you out with. Uh, first, if you want to use chat for just comments that um, or some thoughts to add to as we're going through the discussion. If you have a question in particular about some of the probes or something that requires a little bit more about uh, in a written response, please use the Q&A panel. Or if there's a question about what we're doing, um, specifically that, uh, that if you use the question or Q&A panel, that way it'll be logged in and trackable. You I mean, it's easier to find it and it gets stored instead of a longer thread. Um, if you look in the bottom right, there's a captions area where you would be able to get um, some help if, if it's harder to hear, but you can see some captions. And if you use the little up, up error that's in the captions area, you can have it translate uh, live to other languages, um, sometimes in ways that are entertaining, or uh, but it should help you to, to uh, follow along. Um, it's it's a it's a good option um, to help if you're listening from another uh, first language. So thanks. Those are some things that you can use as we look forward. All right, let's move on then and take a look. We're going to talk a little bit about conductivity and dissolving. Uh, some classic example if, uh, from foods and uh, soup or what you put on your foods, uh, salt, or sodium chloride is is going to be our our, our prototype, our model. Um, what's nice is that um, as we talk about this dissolving process, it's about how ions are surrounded by uh, a solvent, in this case, water. As we're taking a look at it, uh, conductivity is going to work well uh, for aqueous solutions. Um, anything that can have ions that are out and, and mobile, uh, we see as a solid on the left-hand side, those are ions, of course, but they're held in a structured framework that will not allow them to move, so they won't add to the conductivity. But as water surrounds each of these ions, whether they're the negative chloride ion here in the green, um, and notice it's the parts of water that like it that are the opposite partially charged sort of area to pull them out into solution, or water has that partially negative side to pull the positive ions, cations, into solution. Uh, but once they're free and they can move, then they will act as a conductor. As you look at the side of my conductivity sensor here, we're going to use that on a lot of these. Just behind this sort of cutout, there's small little pins in there that will have um, the ability to, to 
then measure the, the conductivity, the, the movement of charge from one pin to the other side. The shape of this shroud here, it's sort of like a castle top, um, also helps to focus the movement of ions between there. So uh, we've calibrated it to, to be the best measure that we can and make this readily available. It's in a sealed sort of container that is nice uh, to keep it from you know, getting splashed and it can be used in a sort of chemical setting. Um, one of the things that's nice in this sense, if you're using uh, a PASCO essential chemistry, let me pull open an example here um, that we have a textbook uh, for called essential chemistry um, is a good example that when we open our book in here, we'll get to a textbook that allows us to, for instance, look for interactives. Um, I can go by that or I could go right to the chapters. I'm just in an ebook basically, and I'm going to look here for our solutions area. Um, in here, you're going to find that um, we've got chapter for solutions. That's basically what we're going to highlight with the conductivity sensor. A couple of pages in here, you see what a chapter looks like. Uh, the teacher material will have materials here on the left for you as a teacher. Um, and, and certainly it'd be a great resource for you. And this is some of the areas I'm getting my slides and imagery from. I'm going to go one more um, page or two more pages. All those areas that you see in the yellow are, are for the teacher. Uh, it's going to be things like your notes and, and uh, labs, uh, vocabulary, things for students to be able to do. You can see here I've got the um, image that I used in my slide. Uh, but what is also nice is that there's some interactive simulations. Um, the process we're going to talk about is to look at how water dissolves an ionic substance like salt. And so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to add some water. And uh, we're going to start the simulation. So if you put a solid material, just the vibration and the Brownian motion of those water molecules have some attractions. As a matter of fact, we want to show the interactions between those. Notice the red side likes the negative green. The red side of water likes the negative uh, ions there. And the white positive protons are good at pulling at the purple uh, sodium atoms. Anyway, as that process goes on, that then substance is freed to be able to flow and pull charge and move charge across the whole beaker or whatever container that you have. So that's that's a nice example of uh, some things that our um, book would support to help student understanding. You can find, obviously, um, there are animations and, and other kinds of simulations that would help your students to understand this process of dissolving. Uh, what I want to do is go ahead and move on to our first example, and um, that is going to be, you know, let's take a, a peek at some series of compounds as they dissolve. And with that, I'm going to jump first, and I, of course, wanted to make sure I did these because we're dealing with so many solutions. I've, I've pre-run and saved some of the images off to the side in case they don't work. Um, but that you can see in, when I had more time and you didn't have to watch me mix solutions, um, I have that data over here and I will pull that if we need to. I do want to show you one run and then we're going to look at how multiple runs compare. Let me bring my software up so that I can go ahead and I'm going to actually bring my conductivity sensor on and I'm going to switch cameras so you can see that process. Let me get it set up over here. go. Oh, nice. Um, let me switch over here. All right. So you can see on a stir plate that I've got solid that's in the bottom of this little beaker. I didn't bring the plug for this, so I'm just, I'm just going to hand stir this. Um, but that's what you would set this up on. I just wanted you to see that uh, as an example of, you know, the way the setup would look. I'll go ahead and I'm going to turn on the probes so that we see them in the software. Let me turn on all those so that we can see. I put a temperature sensor in there as well, just for the added um, sort of ability to, to see if there's some temperature changes. I'm going to go ahead and connect to the conductivity sensor. So I started up our program called SparkView. I'm going ahead and connecting to the temperature, the conductivity, and the drop counter. So each one of these then shows up. If I'm in a room full where all my students are sitting around, they're going to see, you know, other probes like you see in this big list. But the ones that are highest are the sensors that are closest to that specific computer. So usually the students, um, if they're using this in their desk, they will see their sensors are going to be right at the top, which makes it easy to connect. 
So that's the first step we'll do. Let's go ahead and connect to these. Um, the substance that I have in that beaker is sodium chloride. So it's not going to be great uh, mystery that as I add water to it, it should dissolve. I'm going to take these other sensors off just so I can graph my conductivity. Um, and I'll make this as large as I can so you can see that. We're going to watch one and then I'll pull up the other runs so that we can compare it and talk about what we can show students. Um, what's nice about the graph that I went to, I chose a graph. I've got my conductivity here on the left. And most of the time, I'm more concerned about how that uh, conductivity changes. So I'm going to just show as I add the water what happens to the conductivity over time. Um, and I'll stir it, like I said, with my hand. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make sure everything's set up there. Good. And what I'll do is, yep, make sure you got it all set. Go ahead and hit the start button. You see no conductivity. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to show you what dissolving this process would look like to the conductivity sensor. I'm pouring in 100 mils. I'm going to leave a little less room in here so I can stir it. In fact, I'm actually going to take my temperature sensor and stir this so that I can start to see what's happening. In general, obviously, I'm not getting a nice even stir there, but uh, you're seeing in general that my conductivity is going up. Use a bigger beaker on the next one so that we can easily stir that. And I'm just about there. And even though it looks a little looks a little uh, jumpy along the way, what you're going to get the idea is that eventually these are going to plane out. And I'm going to get a conductivity reading because I've dissolved as much as I can. I'm using a tenth of a molar on all of my solutions. And so um, I've used a tenth of a mole, but I put it in 100 mils. So this is actually what one molar solution looks like. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop. I'm going to pull up my presentation again, and we've got then that process. Let's bring these each to the front so you can see those. Um, that one mole of solution for salt is great uh, to, to plane out. This was nice in the sense that when I was using the sensor, it came out to 10,000. Um, then we're going to go back here to the next guy and we'll bring him. But that's that's how much totally dissolves. That's the conductivity of, of that one uh, molar solution. Now I'm going to go and, and use a separate solution. And instead of watching me do those, let's switch back over here. Um, and I, I will have already pre-recorded this so that you can see, oh, here's what calcium chloride is. So where I had sodium chloride before, sodium and chlorine are getting surrounded by water. Now I've got calcium and two chlorines being surrounded by water. What you might notice is this is roughly 10,000. What's the value that's going on to this one when we add uh, this this third ion? We're going up to about 15,000. Um, and I practiced hard to make sure these numbers were really easy to sort of see. Um, I'm going to go ahead and step to the next one where I choose another type of ion. So that was calcium chloride, and we've gone to 15,000. Let me bring this to the front. And um, now I've got aluminum chloride, so AlCl3. Uh, what I chose carefully is we wanted to see how each of these different sort of ions caused. Uh, now, when we look at the max value, a little over 220,000. So we go from 10,000 with ALCL, uh, sorry, calcium chloride with three ions, we go to 15,000 and then up to the top, which is just over 20,000, sorry, we have um, uh, ALCL3. So we have four ions, three ions, two ions. Um, what's nice about this is it would be nice to, if you're probably thinking is, wow, isn't there some way I could get just one ion in there? Um, but Obviously, we hit that idea that ions come in, a, in, in two poles, positive and negative, so we don't ever have a chance to put in one pole. We could say, well, we could maybe put sugar in there. Sugar dissolves, um, and we could. Um, I think if you run a good case here where we take a look at sugar, which is the last example at the bottom, the sucrose, here we don't see any kind of conductivity going on. And that's mostly because what we have in sugar 
as the example shows in the bottom left, um, is just a molecule that's got a little bit of charge, a little negative, you know, a sort of partial charge uh, on the oxygens and a sort of partial positive charge on the hydrogens that are there due to the hydrogen bonding. And water likes that. So here's a good example of like dissolving like, but it doesn't break it apart into ions. They can't carry charge across between those two pins in the conductivity sensor. So what's nice is here, I've just taken three ions, sodium chloride, calcium chloride, very common substances. Aluminum chloride, I didn't have to order, you know, to make uh, as an example, but in, in most labs, you should be able to get that pretty easily. Um, uh, and you can just dissolve those and it worked out very, very well. 5,000, 15,000, 20,000. As a matter of fact, you divide by the smallest of these, you'd see it goes in a, in a super easy ratio, which I'll show as an example next. Now, you may look at these graphs as well and say, uh, oh, there's some things that kind of get confusing. Look at how fast, for instance, the aluminum chloride dissolves, where it takes a little bit less time, sorry, more time to get the salt dissolved, and calcium chloride takes sort of the longest. That may confuse or or, or, you know, sort of confound some issues about dissolving. But it is nice to see that the stable, when they're all dissolved, they're in a two to three to four ion ratio. It's a great way for students to see that. Just the height of these shows the amount of ions that are there. Okay, so next we're going to switch over again and we're going to want to watch. Instead, I'm going to go and I'm going to take a solution and let's swing back to our, our, uh, spark view what i'm going to do is i'm going to switch and we're going to let me switch cameras again so you can see that we're going to switch this setup and bring in just a again a drop counter and a conductivity sensor uh, make sure i've got oh i can still use this one that's the right one like i said there's lots of solutions here so i was working hard to make sure i had them all set up now, what I have in my um, in my syringe, my dropper that's at the top here, is an aluminum chloride. Here we saw what the conductivity was for uh, in the graph that's showing on the screen. That's what it looks like for sodium chloride dissolving. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add 100 mils to this water so that I just have something that these drops can go in and I get enough to cover the bottom of the sensor. Okay, so I've put some water in the bottom, just like a titration. You'd usually add some volume of water just so that the ions have some chance to move. And I'm going to turn the drop counter on to start dropping in. Um, let me make sure. I, yeah, the aluminum chloride. Um, and we're going to see if we have a little bit different sort of a look. I'll go ahead and I'll turn this one off. So that I was, I was saying I would just put the solid in and we can compare the total amount that dissolves. That's the first step in helping students understand what conductivity uh, conductivity readings mean. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to help the student understand when we are adding in solution into another solution, what should I expect to see? Now, if that's the case, I want to change instead of just how the time concentration changes, I want to show how as I add more fluid, if I add more aluminum chloride dissolved, what happens to the conductivity as it's going into the bottom tank. Okay, so let me get that set up. I want to make sure my drop counter and everybody's all connected since I connected it up before. I'm going to go ahead and turn this guy on. Make sure I can see my little drops coming in. There we go. Now they're starting to come through. I'm going to go ahead and stir these. I can see the drops coming through. Awesome. They're coming at about one or two a second. I'm going to speed that up just a little bit. And we should start this. There we go. And I'll go ahead and start stirring. Speed that up just a touch. There we go. Now it's going. And what you see is a nice straight line. Yeah, that makes sense because you're slowly adding a little bit of volume, but an even amount. Now you don't have to confuse the issue because the dissolving process, the rate of dissolving, the rate of solution is different than the total solubility, how much can dissolve. And so that may have been confounding an issue than just putting some water onto solid material and watching how fast it dissolves. The key on the previous uh, sort of demonstration was we wanted students to be able to see what total amount dissolves, the height of that graph when it stabilizes. And this one, I really just want them to see 
the slope of how fast this goes up, because that is corresponded to how many ions are showing up in solution over time as I'm dripping in a constant sort of rate of material, in this case, aluminum chloride. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. So you see how I've done this process. Let's take a look at what the data looks like. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop. It's not moving right now because I'm just, I'm graphing volume, the number of drops that have fallen through versus the conductivity. And since no drops are falling, I'm not getting more data even though the time continues. I'll go ahead and stop that. Let's take a look at our data that I collected. Um, this is, this is notice uh, as I, I was gonna kind of go through these examples, I wanna show what happens as I use different sort of solutions. I try to use a 10th molar point, or sorry, one molar solution of both sodium chloride. That's this first example. Then we're gonna take a look at calcium chloride. I'll make that a little bigger. Okay, and the third one here is the aluminum chloride. Now, I see that each one has a little steeper kind of a, a slope. If you look at the beginning of the aluminum chloride, you notice there's sort of a weird, it's not straight like the other two are. And that's because when I was getting it to drop, I, they were coming through fast enough, I was missing some of the drops. So I had to wait until I made sure it was dropping right through the center of the drop counter. And I get this nice, you know, sort of rate that goes on. As a matter of fact, if I use the tools inside of SparkView, um, I can say, what's the slope of that? Here, I'm changing at a 96, okay, conductivity units per volume per mil of added material. This next one, 145, and the third one, 183. And you're like, ah, oh, that's not an easy ratio to kind of get the hang of. So if I divide all of these by the smallest number, if I divide all of those slopes by 96, I get a ratio of one, and let me simplify this to one and a half to 1.9, almost two, one to one and a half to two. And you say, well, that's still not a whole number. So if I double those, I get two to three to four. That's the number of ions each of these breaks into. And so the slope on the types of titrations, basically I'm using it as a titration or talking about it like a titration, is actually telling me how many ions are in solution. And I can actually determine what that substance is. Okay. I've taken a lot of time at the beginning of this webinar to help understand what these lines can mean. The height of it is how many ions are there, and the slope itself gives me an idea of which substance is acting. And the reason I do that is so that in my next two examples um, that you can start to interpret maybe what's less familiar to you into a more, you know, to give you a sort of a familiarity of, of how the conductivity should be looking. Uh, of course, we get used to pH in their titrations, but we may not be as used to seeing how the conductivity changes as we go through. All right. So let's use the drop counter as a titration sort of follower. I'm going to go ahead and pull this aluminum chloride, which we just watched as I added a set volume into solution. I'll go ahead and get this guy out of there. I'll grab a new... Roger, speaker. while you're setting up that new uh, system, Set there's there's a mm -hmm. question of, uh, are you using a temperature probe too? Oh yeah, I, I actually, I am. And uh, let's let's actually create a new chart. That was a great question, thank you. Um, well, let's just take a look and see. What I was really interested in, here's my graph, and I was showing the concentration uh, sorry, the con conductivity versus the fluid volume. Let me add a new graph just so you can see the process. This is this is again SparkView. I'm going to add a new table. I'll choose as you know just a whole new sheet, and I'm going to choose a new graph. But let's watch how the instead of uh, I'm going to add on the y-axis here what's the temperature, what is happening to the temperature, and okay, let's do that, Mike. And over time. And let's look at that second run specifically, because that first one was a little irregular. The second run was nice and smooth. What's happening is I'm seeing that the solution, and it's not warming up by much. It's 22.3 to 22.4, because we already have the dissolving is done. But that process of getting it to dissolve even further is a warming process. It's giving up energy. And so the reason I wanted to mention it is because this is a, just a bit of an exothermic process. It's giving up energy. Uh, uh, the energy of that system is going up. So it is nice to follow if you wanted to use that to, to follow, especially as I get to the last slide in my presentation that um, 
I'm really giving you a very qualitative kind of a look at how you can use a conductivity sensor to help students understand. Um, but this could become quantitative as well to see just how much temperature change and how much volume of liquid you had. You could calculate some of the enthalpies, for instance. Okay, thank you. I think that addresses that question. Awesome. So we're going to take a look at the titration. I've got a setup over here. Let's switch over so you can see that. I've got the same setup that I've had the others. I got temperature, conductivity, and the drop counter. Again, I wanted to keep the same setups just so that you're, you know, that's not the issue that we're looking at. What I'd like to do is I would like to take um, and put a weak acid into. Oh, I'm glad I looked at that because uh, I grabbed the wrong one. <laughs> that's why I labeled these. Let me grab this guy. Adjust that just a little bit so it's up above here. There we go. So what I want to do here is I want to do a classic titration. Uh, I'm going to add a weak acid, which I have up on top is vinegar. And then on the bottom, I'm going to put in some sodium hydroxide. So like any, any titration, I'm going to put some of the sodium hydroxide into there. I'm going to put 10 mils into that. I'll take my pipette and put a known volume. So if I know the volume and the concentration. I will know how many moles of hydroxide I have. Let me go ahead and pull out some solution there. So I'm putting a known volume of a known concentration, a tenth molar. All the concentrations I'm using today are tenth molar. Again, I'm trying to keep the concept of what we're doing. Oh, let me pull a little bit more. All the same so that we're not having to think about, you know, strange or, you know, high or low numbers of concentrations. All these are 10th molar solutions of everything. Uh, the one thing I did make a little difference was the solids I used was a mole. Well, truthfully, I used a 10th of a mole in a 10th of a liter. So that ended up becoming a one molar solution on those first two examples. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put this on there. Okay. There I've got 10 mils of sodium hydroxide, 10th molar. Go and put this off to the other side now. Okay, let me put um, the connectivity sensor and the temperature sensor. Oop, I'm gonna grab the ones that are on because those are convenient. Well, Roger's setting up, I'm gonna um, answer a question that was asked in the Q&A. What are the concentration sensitivity limits of this probe? Thank you. Okay, so um, the most recent release of this probe, it's I believe around 40,000 micro siemens per cubic centimeter, or per centimeter, is that correct, Roger? Yeah, and it starts to get nonlinear after that. So um, that doesn't quite get you up to, it's brackish water, but I think, what is it, 60, 70,000 for ocean water. And, um, and yeah, 40,000 is should handle three molar, I would say, somewhere in there, based on what we just saw in those last titrations, about three molar solutions. And um, if, if we remembered incorrectly, I'm pasting the link to the sensor in the chat right now. So um, the specs oh, will you. be posted there in, in on that website. Um, also, the second question was, how resistant are the probes to strong acids and bases? Like, what's the max concentration that you could be using? Oh, that's a good question, too. Um, I mean, both the stainless steel temperature sensor and the and the conductivity probe are stainless steel. So I you know, one molar is going to be just fine. Two molars, fine. It's somewhere above there is going to start to um, see some issues. Um, I would be, I would feel comfortable. I would say, I mean, honestly, right at the top of my head, I, I, I'm not sure where stainless steel starts to corrode. Um, and I should, I should find out. I, I would say three molar probably be as, as up there as I would be dealing with, um, you know, right at the top of my head. Um, maybe we can get higher than that, but I, I just don't know. That'd be a good Google Google question or or I could, you know, that's what I'd end up doing to to find out where that starts, the corrosion starts to happen. Maybe it's much higher. Um, I did use six molar um, in some of my classes for uh, materials. Um, I wasn't necessarily using probes at that time, but I, I, yeah, that's, I would have solutions as strong as that. That'd be sort of about what stomach acid is. So uh, anyway, uh, it's a good question, and um, we certainly can look to see if I can jot a note in, in the presentation once we send this out as well. Um, but 
those are, I would feel pretty comfortable up to three more. Um, but I just don't know what the top is, so we're out of the top of my head. Okay, so now what I've got is, uh, like I said, I've got uh, some solution in the bottom. I've got the um, vinegar here. I'm gonna add 100 mils to my um, volume of that um, volume of that uh, flask so that, you know, we just have a volume that we can work with. And right now I'm just pouring myself a nice 100 mil vol flask of some water. You could be using a graduated cylinder. I like the wall flask because it's accuracy is such that we can just measure that right up. And we're gonna pour that in. Again, that's more just to get the volume up so that the sensor can reach down and into that solution and monitor what's going on. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, pull over the software again, and I'm gonna reconnect to those sensors because I'm not sure, because I changed setups. Um, the connectivity sensor is 439 uh, on, the, on the device themselves. Oh, that is not the one I want. So, oh, connectivity, 439 is correct. Temperature is 268. And then the drop counter, 975. Yep. So let me connect to that. While that's connecting, I'm going to put the link to the drop counter product page in chat. Okay, so we've got a connectivity sensor in. What's nice about our software is if you look down towards the bottom where those two um, readings are showing, this is what the current connectivity is right now, 2,398 microsiemens per centimeter. Um, I'm going to that, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off run two so that we just get the shape. And we're gonna be adding an acid to this strong base, sodium hydroxide that's in there. Um, we're starting off at, like I said, 2,400-ish. Um, I could lift this up a little bit so that we get the scale, you know, so it takes up some of the space. Notice uh, I'm demonstrating this so you can see in the software how easy it is to change the sort of scale on here. I'm gonna go ahead and since we're using volume, it doesn't mean anything once I hit the start. The dot is just showing up there just barely. And let's go ahead and add this base to the solution. There we go. And a question came up, is the drop counter calibrated before starting? Uh, yes, it was calibrated ahead of time. Uh, it comes mm -hmm. factory calibrated, but you could calib uh, it, it, your calibration is good for distilled water and um, like low molar solutions like 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide would be fine, um, but you can custom calibrate as well when you change solvents or rather um, titrants. The drum has a, a fairly thin tip, and so those come out as pretty standard size drops um, as well. So that in terms of, you know, what's the volume per drop? If you're using your own burettes, you could run five mils through and get a drop size and actually put that number in. What's the volume per drop so that that can be shown? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and keep stirring that as we go. But we get a fast drop other than that little pick up right at the bottom, we are already now in. Now, is, there, is that just not changing? Is there actually some change happening in that long run out? And that's the reason I've, this is exactly the shape it should be. And I'll show you six other runs when we're done here. I'm just giving it a good swirl. But if you look, that's actually got a little bit of slope to this here. And so this is a big fast drop as the sodium hydroxide is being taken out. I'm gonna let it run a little bit more as we're talking, even though it's not being stirred. I'll just give it a quick stir, but you'll see it does not change the connectivity that much. And what's being added here is the excess now acetic acid, which doesn't break apart that much. So it's got a very, you know, for every drop, there's not much more conductive material going into solution. But as you are putting it in, the base gets consumed by that acid. And so the conductivity drops really quickly. Here's a strong base and there is a weak acid response. That's, that's what we should be looking for in the sense of uh, conductive curve. I'm gonna go ahead and stop that. I'm gonna turn this off and let me pull back the presentation.
So let's take a look at several um, of these curves. So I went through and had a strong assets, strong base, weak asset, and a weak base. And we just went through all the combinations. So if we're taking a look at this, um, let's start off with this first one, uh, which is the, it's a weak, well, it's what we just ran, the strong base, sodium hydroxide with the weak acid. But I also ran it in, in opposite, where I actually titrated the strong sodium hydroxide into the vinegar. Now, it's how can these two be the same in terms of conductivity? Look here, we talked already, the sodium hydroxide, as that gets made into water, it's no longer conductive and disappears quite quickly. But as you add drops of vinegar, only one in 50, one in 20 of those particles actually breaks apart into two ions. So it takes 20 drops before you change even a little bit of conductivity. So how can this be the same sort of process? If you notice though, when we drop this down, we're somewhere, you know, where the change in this is happening, somewhere near the other one. So what was disappearing before, this, the second one, is where we are adding the base to the acetic acid. So as we get rid of acetic acid, this has a slow sort of downturn, okay? And then as we add this, this has a stronger upturn as that sodium hydroxide is being excess and being added. Okay, that looks like our curves, like we did when we dissolved those great salts in the beginning. Okay, let's take a look at a different one, see if we can build our understanding. All right, let's take a look at um, this one here is where we're adding a weak base to a strong acid. So the green side is where the weak base is going in. Weak base is going in and it's neutralizing, taking out the strong acid, the strong acid is becoming water. And so as you take each of those strong acids, its conductivity is disappearing quite quickly. And just like what we saw in the previous case, after we get all the acid out of the way, the weak base, which is just baking soda basically, is slowly, you know, only some of that, you know, wants to pull a hydrogen and make hydroxide in solution, um, is slowly adding to the conductivity. Now, what's cool about this is that when we switch these two, you start to see maybe the mirror effect that's happening. Here, if we are dropping in the baking soda, as that disappears, again, you're not getting a lot back because you know the acids are taking out the baking soda, but each of those baking sodas disappearing um, isn't changing a lot. Where it's this two parts is where here the acid's disappearing, and then on the high rise is where the acid is appearing. They should have the same slopes, but just be negatives of each other. And that's what's really nice if you run a series, like I say, a weak acid, weak base, strong acid, strong ba base, and you run about eight, you know, each one of those in comparison, that your students can get a strong, stronger understanding of how this conductivity titration works. Okay, let's look at another example. Oh, come on. Let me hit this. Here we go. Let me get this out. There we go. Roger, I can see that the equivalence points are also lining up perfectly on those forward and reverse data displays. You know, it's interesting. As many titrations as I've done as a teacher for 30 years with acid base and using a pH sensor, did tons of them. I'd not done very many conductivity sort of um, uh, titrations. And so last week, all week long, I just kept running these. I'm like, I gotta get some good examples where people can see these. Uh, what we need to do is turn around and make this data available too. Um, I did base it on the blog, which had some some good examples of what this looks like. Again, um, so it was a new experience for me, even though I taught a lot of titrations using the conductivity data, it took me seeing both adding the acid to the weak base and, uh, sorry, adding a strong acid to the weak base, but then the weak base to the strong acid, where I was able to start to make sense of what these mean. So hopefully that's what you're seeing in each of these. And when you get the presentation, you'll you'll be able to kind of roll through these as well as examples. Um, so here, as the acid is disappearing, it's a strong, this one's the uh, blue. So we have a strong acid and it's disappearing, but it disappears and it takes a lot of ions out as it disappears. Okay, once it's all gone, you're adding a weak base in, and so it doesn't show up as many ions, only a few of them break apart in solution or ionize. Uh, but if you run it the other way, here's where we're getting rid of the weak uh, base, the baking soda, it slowly, conductivity slowly rises. But then once the um, the base is there and you're, that's right, yeah, 
this uh, strong, no, once the acid is in excess, then it starts to increase because every drop puts in, you know, a, a larger number of ions. And so that's the, the, the blue run is where we've added the weak base in and taking out strong acid. And the red one is where we're adding the acid into the uh, baking soda. Okay, so those are good comparisons. Quick question, Roger. Can you share yeah. the Spark View files later? Yeah, absolutely. I'll put them all together. Um, like I said, I, I ran hundreds of these last week trying to find, you know, the right kinds of concentrations and which ones sort of tell the best story and how to even pair them together. So you'll get it. Um, you'll get the presentation right away. I'll, I'll send those um, out at the email. You'll get it as a recording. But if you want um, specifically the data in those, I'm happy to do that. That'd be great. Um, we can just put a package together and send it to everybody on the webinar. Okay, let's finish. Um, this is a fun one, I think, as we finish out. And this is where um, we have a weak acid and a weak base. So notice, what do you notice about the two slopes? They're both eh, a little less. You know, this isn't much, 600 to 900. Um, I've scaled them all, so this is actually exaggerated. But these, this isn't as big a jump as those previous ones. Um, and here's a good, another good example. You have what's a little bit steeper as the base is disappearing, but then a long, slow climb. So this slope should be the equivalent of basically about this slope. And the first, which looks a little steeper, should be mirroring this. This is as the, um, in this case, the weak acid is disappearing. And here's as the weak acid starts showing up. So each of those is a great way for students um, to go through and see the changes in, in uh, how conductivity can show what's going on to the, to the base itself. Um, and the acids amounts. So that's a that's a good sort of running exercise. Okay, so that's that's basically what I used. Um, 0.1 molar solutions, and I used acetic acid. Um, I took that just right from the store because it ended up working really well with 0.1 molar solutions. Um, a baking soda, 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid, and 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. Okay, so once they've seen these, if you want to use those as demonstrations and, and to do your own sort of titrations, then you can go on to something that is interesting for the student, maybe citric acid like Alka-Seltzer, uh, as you add citric acid to baking soda. Um, we have a lab that, that looks at that in terms of stoichiometry or bleach or malic acid, something that has, you know, these weaker or stronger, sorry, most of these are weak uh, examples to, to have the students go in and find out what those concentrations are. But that's what I would suggest as, as sort of the next step. All right, let's go on to, it's not just, I mean, this conducting method isn't just for acid and base chemistry. So I want to finish as a live example, taking a look at, at a precipitation reaction. Okay, so let me go ahead and take this guy out of the way. And uh, while Roger sets it up, I'm going to paste the link for the SparkView software off our website into chat. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to get SparkView. Many options are free. And that is the software that Roger's been using with the sensors. Nice is that uh, we also recently had made a basic web version that is available as well. If you go to pasco.com, and what's the last part? Pasco.com slash. Okay, but we'll put that in the as a link. All right. So what I'm doing in this last one is I'm gonna run a reaction that's calcium chloride with um, sodium carbonate. Now, the big thing is I have to look at my notes to remember which one's where. So sodium carbonate is in the dropper and I'm gonna put a calcium chloride amount in the bottom here. So just like we did in a titration, this is my calcium chloride that I pre-mixed. Let me get this so you can see that. I have some calcium chloride that's, again, 10th molar. All of this stuff is all 10th molar. Kept it easy. Um, let me put in 10 mils. Oh, yeah, that's right. But, yeah, I'll start off with 10 mils of this. Okay, I'm just using a pipette. Draw out a pull. Oopsie. I'll let that big old bubble get in there. There we go. Oh, I got to refill my, my pet filler. There we go. Okay, so I've got 10 mils. I'm going to put 10 mils of calcium chloride 
into the bottom. So I'm titrating the amount of calcium that's in this solution out. And this one was a surprise. We do have a lab for this one, which I will list on the webpage when I bring that back up. Okay, let me take that tip off here. Awesome. Sort of surprised. I thought, well, let me make sure that I'm, you know, using the right amounts um, while I was doing the lab. And so I tried 10 mils and then I tried 20 mils and I tried 30 mils to see which one gave me sort of the best look for um, this lab. I'm going to pour water into that so that it, the water now goes up. But I know my starting volume and I know the concentration. So I know the molarity and the volume. So the MV, basically, this is a technique, yep, that we're using from titration acids. And you could use it to figure out how much calcium's in that solution, because you're going to add an MV from the titration source here. Add the water so that it doesn't add more ions, just raises that up so that it comes to the top. Good. All right. Now, we've got it set up so the fluid volume's there, and I'm going to change to a new set of sensors. i got to turn the other ones off. Again, this is good muscle memory, so you see the process. I'll turn the other ones off so I don't uh, pull from them. There we go. Turn this last one off. We'll finish out the last example. Okay. Awesome. So now I'm going to put in sodium carbonate into calcium chloride. And what's going to happen is calcium chloride is insoluble. It'll start to form precipitate, which hopefully you'll see is sort of a cloudiness that's going on in there. Now, before I hit the start button, I got to make sure that I'm hooked up to these specific probes. Okay. Zero, zero. Oh, I still left that other one on. That's fine. I'll just hook up to the one I know is the zero, zero, zero. That's the specific drop counter. And I'll go to the conductivity and temperature sensor. Yeah, I'll get that one out of there. Yeah, that was the old one. And we'll pull the temperature in there too. And I'll I'll just awesome. Nine forty. Yeah, we'll pull that one up. Two eighty five. Let me make sure everybody's connected. There we go. Yeah, the temperature sort of okay. Got them all. All right, so I'm still mapping the conductivity versus the volume. And then we'll talk about what that means here in just a second. Oh, this one does. Oh, yeah, we just have to change this. Yep, we're going to have to choose the right drop counter, which is the zeros. Okay. Oh, nope, nope. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> change the conductivity, which is up there with the drop counter down here. Zero, 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 drop counter fluid volume. All right. So I had to get the right conductivity sensor, which is sitting here, and I'm using the fluid from the drop counter. And so I made sure that those are the, I'm reading the right instruments, that's all. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and start this. Again, I'm going to go ahead and start the dropper. Make sure I get a nice, there we go. And I want it to sort of come through at a good rate. There we are. And I'm going to turn this. Um, as I'm going through. Okay, I'm going to turn up that pace a little bit. The drop counter can count up to 40 drops per second, which I thought, man, really? Um, but it really does, until it almost becomes a continuous stream, it's pretty darn good at counting drops. You're going to see it take off here. There we go.
just so that you don't have to sit through these. And then I'll show you the idealized ones I collected before. But you notice at the beginning, we sort of have this weird rise. And at some point in here, what we're going to see is a slow resulting rise. And you may say, oh, is there something wrong? Ah, there it is. Notice it came up to about here, 16 drops or 16 mils until it started to make a slow move. I'm going to let it go for just a little bit more. So you think, ah, okay, that is a trend, not just something I'm making up, which as a teacher you do sometimes. You're like, oh yeah, that's the way it is. Now go ahead and start your lab. <laughs> but what's happened is up to this point, there was very little change going on. And that's because I didn't have a lot of the um, calcium chloride in. I didn't have a very large volume. And the two ions had to get up to a certain concentration. That's what the ion uh, product is. You know, the two ions can only be to some extent in solution together. And then a change started to occur. Ah, now each drop is actually changing the conductivity. So until either right here or right here, that every drop that was going in wasn't creating new and free ions. They were getting caught up in, in utilizing the old substance. Now I'm up to the point about where the concentration is the same for both ions. So let's go take a look at a clear example, but that's what that data looks like. This is still gonna continue to dry, climb again. And I'm gonna hit stop. I'll go ahead and stop this. Let's take a look at what that good data ends up looking like. So when I was using 10 mils of starting material of calcium chloride, notice it did that sort of weird start. In other words, it was being consumed, but I didn't see a lot of big change in, in conductivity until all the calcium was consumed and then the extra, um, that's the chloride. Uh, the chloride is being consumed, calcium is being consumed, sorry. And then the, and here's where the carbonate starts to add to the conductivity. So I thought, ah, I should add some more. I'm going to use 20 mils of calcium chloride. Here I actually saw the, the conductivity going down as the calcium gets consumed. And then here's where the, again, the uh, carbonate's taking off and making every drop makes more conductive. And here's when I had 30 mils. Notice each time I go from about 10 where the inflection point is. Here the inflection point's around 20. And here it's around 30. Again, the, the value of using those nice sort of 10th molar solutions is that um, I can make sense of these is that I had to titrate a lot more calcium before the turnaround happens. But I can use that volume because I know how much the concentration of is what I'm dropping from the top from this sort of dropper into there and I can figure out how much calcium was there. And that's what the lab is based on. So if you go to pasco.com slash resources and look for tap water, you can use your own tap water, do this kind of a, a titration and you will see based on this volume, and you know the concentration, how much calcium is in your water. You may ask, well, what, what's important about calcium? It, it, it ends up making and ties up your soap so that it leaves soap scum and some other kinds of ill effects in, in your own homes, um, but it, it's what leaves, and it leaves you know spots behind. So anyway, that's the, the background for calcium and why that makes a difference. Now, the other thing that it's great for is if they've gone through and you've determined the calcium based on this titration technique, that is a precipitate. I don't know if you can see that. that well, it's pretty darn milky. You can't see my fingers through that. Um, so you could let that sit and filter it and then weigh those out and determine which of these two is actually more accurate. Um, personal experience, I've seen that it's probably about 10 times more accurate. In other words, I get... Uh, one order of magnitude larger error when I'm just using my filter paper uh, because a lot of it gets either makes it around the filter or it doesn't get weighed. Um, and so that's that's a nice um, that's a nice add on to to what's a technique wise um, gives you some accuracy that's pretty amazing. So to sort of summarize, um, conductivity sets the stage. I think it's great that it's at this time of the year. You're talking about solutions. You've just, you know, probably gone through gas laws and solids and liquids and the sort of intermolecular attractions and that kind of thing. Uh, till then, talking about gatherings of of uh, particles that are in solutions, they have a variable mixture, um, and you start to understand what that. This gives you great examples of what the dissolving process looks like, um, how that conductivity can be followed, so you know how many ions are in solution. Um, it sets the stage so that you can talk about that same process in acids and bases that may look a little bit different in terms of a graph, but it really adds to their understanding. The slopes on those on those graphs can tell you a little bit about how the concentrations are changing, get them ready for kinetics, thermodynamics. And so I think these examples in solution are something that's great to set up 
a better understanding for the rest of topics that you can cover still yet in your year. If you're at the college, you may still get through three more sets of topics, like I said, kinetics or thermodynamics. If you're in high school, um, this may be, you know, then you go on to something more like organic or something. Um, but it does lead to the these other topics that are coming up. And if they can understand how those change, then they're understanding how concentrations are changing. Now, can this also be used in other ways at the school? Absolutely. Here's a good example of a, of a project that I had done when I was in the classroom. Um, this is a little river system that's about 20 miles long, just outside of Grand Forks, North Dakota. This little sort of a reservoir that's right here. And we were measuring the conductivity. You can see it. I measured it four times during the year. Um, used my phone's GPS to know exactly where it was. And it wasn't very conductive in these first three. But then when you get down to the bottom, this was six times more conductive water. We started to ask some questions. Why and what did that do? Um, first of all, we were looking for why. And we started looking on the topo maps and found all these little sand, you know, these little pickaxes are supposed to be quarries for sand. Um, but there were also some places that had like water treatment plants. So there was a couple of airports and we we're trying to figure out if any one of these could explain that, that uh, change in conductivity. Of course, after a couple of years, we finally had somebody from the local university who helped, to under, helped us to understand um, it wasn't any of those point sources at all. But you can see these three aquifers that are in there. The first one is just a sand aquifer from old glaciers. And so that didn't dissolve or leave any solid content dissolved in the water. But these two were from the old ocean that used to cover the middle of, of you know, the continent. And so the, the limestone and things were starting to come out in these aquifers. What did that mean in terms of life? Here's a cool set of graphs showing the more green, the, the higher, more uh, the more sensitive bugs that existed. Down here was leeches and, and things that were slimy or snails that didn't need that much. Um, it, it could handle high salinity or high saltiness. But up here were the bugs that the fish liked to eat. And there was a state park that, that encouraged fishing there. And so what was fun is after a couple of years of that work, and we finally got the, the story down, is that the students were able to go and tell that story to a park interpretive talk. And the students were the experts. And so here's a fun quote from one of the students that just said he loved it. He said, this is the one thing I'll remember from high school. And he was always interested in, in being able to do stuff outdoors. And he just thought that was yeah, the greatest. And I heard that from numbers of students. Um, you know, each student has some things that that uh, intrigue them more. So that was a nice way to add it in. And the conductivity sensor is, is going to be able to do that for some students. Now, with that in mind, if there are questions that you have, you've always got a local person that's, that's good to be able to contact, and that's your regional sort of uh, uh, representative. You can contact support. Um, if you have questions, um, you can contact uh, Barbara and myself. I think I'm going to have our, our uh, numbers here in just a second, our emails. And so um, I just wanted to finish with that. When we're done, you will finish and you're going to get a, a survey um, that you can fill out um, in a follow-up email that will have a link for this presentation. Um, specifically, what I'll do is to put that together the um, the databases that we had, and I'll give those to Glenn to make sure we mail it out to the list of anybody that was also here, um, because we love to share that. And um, you can just open them up inside of, of SparkView, and you can see what that data is. Um, sometimes looking at that data, you just have to have it in front of you with the software running, and you can just open it up with SparkView, uh, excuse me, and, um, and examine it than yourself, or you can just use it as the slides um, and, and take a peek. But hopefully you've enjoyed the time that we've had together. Um, I'll give a few more minutes for questions um, and that's it from here. But let me go back up to this first slide so that you have our contact information. Oh, I didn't put it there. Our email strat, uh, you know, our email sort of um, is, is our first letter, last name at pasco.com. So rpalmer at pasco.com or bpuglisi at uh, pasco.com. So feel free to to throw that in if you'd like. Yep. I also put those in the chat too. So. Oh, perfect. Awesome. And thanks. Yeah, this one took a lot because there was a lot of solutions and I had to clearly label them and practice them a ton. And even then, it can be a little crazy to, to demo these number of different kinds of reactions. Um, but yeah, the conductivity sensor is a, is a strong uh, supporter and, and just getting used to what it reports back is is the trick. And so I think that series was my best attempt to what I would have brought my students through to, to one, understand what it's reading, and two, then what does it mean and how does it sort of affect classic titrations and conductivity of uh, precipitates. Okay.
Well, Barbara and I both appreciate oh, one more the question. time that you spent. One more question. Another question? Sure. Yeah, how portable is the conductivity sensor for field work? Well, let me pull this out and I'll hold it up for you. It's great, as a matter of fact, yeah, it's this big. And usually I just hook it up to my phone. I turn on my GPS if I'm you know, doing a study like we did on that last example. And so it's just in my phone and I'm holding this with one hand and my phone in the other, or maybe you know, one person's holding the phone and the other person's taking this and they can either you know, reach it down into there or you could literally tape it to a, like a cool walking stick. Um, or a fishing pole. Or a fishing pole, <laughs> yep. Uh, you can see here that there's a sort of waterproof uh, seal. Um, I wouldn't call it, I mean, don't sink it 10 meters under the water, but it, it, it could handle getting wet and getting dropped in the water and those kinds of things. This series was made specifically to be able to take that, that little better, um, you know, exposure to getting wet. So, nope, I think it's a great sensor and it's a good one for water quality, um, but it's also great in the lab. And one of the measurements it has that uh, Roger didn't display um, today was TDS, total dissolved solids. So you can also measure that as a water quality metric. We use a we use a uh, ion coefficient of 0.61, I think 0.65. It says in the in the handout, um, and so that would be. You can put different numbers in if you think you're working with ocean water, or if you're um, if you're using you know kind of lake water, um, and a little bit of reading would help you understand. If you want to change that, you can. But that's the most common use would be freshwater, and that's why we chose the coefficient we did. If you pull that number, it'll just read it off in parts per million. Well, excellent. Thank you for your time. Um, Barbara and I both appreciate that uh, we were able to, to show you ways to use some of our sensors. Um, and at this point in time of the year, we wish you the best of luck as you're getting your students ready, either for AP exams or as you're winding towards the end of the year. Um, hang in there. The summer's on the way, and uh, we wish you just the best with your classes. Enjoy.